Comic book movies, or superhero movies, are the new blockbuster thing. Marvel seems to be doing it right, and DC even not so well. Per my patron's request, I decided to analyze the comic book to live action movie superhero genre and see what makes an effective superhero movie. This is not an in-depth look at specific movies, but rather the entire genre as a whole. The medium is the message versus the source material. Live action movies are not 30 minute animated TV shows, nor are they animated films. They are their own beast, with hiring directors, film crews, set designers, makeup and wardrobe people, and especially both practical and CGI special effects. There's a lot of people doing a lot of different things, and they come from different disciplines. These disciplines have their own philosophies and requirements, which can supersede the vision of the actual production, especially if director or producer is unaware of these multiple secondary visions. When making a movie, you get someone who knows how to write movie scripts. In the original Superman movie, Mario Puzo, the author of the Godfather story as well as the writer of the screenplay of the Godfather movies, was brought in to write the script. The original concept of The Godfather obviously had to be adapted to film, and who better than to get the original author of the story? In Superman's case, even with Puzo's script, which was 550 pages, it was given rewrites by several other writers to make it fit into the format of an hour and 43 minute movie. One of the writers, Richard Donner, said, that was literally a shooting script and they planned to shoot all 550 pages. You know, 110 pages is plenty for a script, so even for two features, that was way too much. He also said a lot of the scenes were way too campy and wouldn't work too well in film. So the transition from comic book to screenplay to edits to finally being made into a movie is a long and arduous process going through several hands, each tweaking and changing things as it goes. Things are bound to get added to, and some are to be removed, some change for the better, and some for the worse. What matters in porting over any primary source material into a new medium are two things. One, are the plots and characterizations the same, and two, is the spirit and theme of the work preserved? Still, these two points can be secondary to the movie medium itself. That secondary feeling can best be found in the 1989 Batman movie, which was a Tim Burton film. As such, the setting of Gotham was the character. Everything about it screamed creepy, weird, dark, seedy, and dangerous. Batman also appeared as austere, deadly, and mysterious. Both Gotham and Batman were a big enough spectacle to keep people interested. The design of the Batmobile was sleek and elegant, and since personas are born from settings and one's environment, combined with a stellar cast, the general audience could sit back and enjoy the spectacle of bizarre enough characters in an over-the-top, violent, comic-like city. The spectacle of the movie, with its unique, dark look, became its own characterization. Even though Batman's methods, that is, not to kill, was downplayed and not really paid attention to, the characterization and performance of everyone else was relatively true to form. It was a superhero movie, it's supposed to be melodramatic, and murder became comical and matter-of-factly as goons exited the scene, sometimes to their deaths. Even Jack Nicholson's performance as the crowned prince of crime, as goofy and easily replaceable as it was, with let's say uh, Robin Williams' performance, was relatively acceptable within the boundaries of madness and intelligence of what a gangster joker might have been like. It wasn't great, but it got the job done. It was in the ballpark. Being a crazy, gyrating mastermind apparently isn't too hard to pull off. Especially when you're this guy. The spirit and theme of a Batman comic was maintained, and with the variety in different independent Batman series, the average hardcore fan could appreciate the production on budget and production value alone. Through the visual spectacle of a Tim Burton production, it elevated the dark comic book campiness of the world of Gotham City into an art form. It was a respectable combination. What are you? I'm Batman. A change in tone doesn't really matter, provided it matches the premise of the production. So tone is the overall feeling of a piece of work. This is part of setting as much as it is a part of characterization. And there's a difference between those two. The classical characterizations of, for example, Superman is usually that of warmth or confidence, uh, goodness, honesty, truthfulness, heroism, justice, manners, the, the American ideals. I'm here to fight for truth and justice in the American way. <laughs> You're gonna end up fighting every elected official in this country. He's the definitive superhero, similar to Marvel's Captain America. It's the honest surface level of what is the heroic good and true. They're both American and believe in such values. If I see a situation pointed south, I can't ignore it. So 
Sometimes I wish I could. No, you don't. The characterization of Superman in Zack Snyder's Man of Steel is a bit different. It is a redefinition of his origin story. What would a Superman be like in today's age? Instead of a salt-of-the-earth American father in Jonathan Kent, we have a conflicted, hesitant father too scared of telling his son right from wrong. Instead, he's unsure of what's good and bad. What was I supposed to do? Just let him die? Maybe. Yes, David S. Goyer, saving a school bus full of kids is the right thing to do. Jonathan should have said something like, no, you did the right thing. You saved those lives. God gave you a gift, and you have to use that gift. If I've taught you anything, Clark, is to help those in need. You didn't do anything wrong, son. We're just scared that people are going to find out about you. Yes, Christopher Nolan, Clark should have run into a tornado just to save his dad. In fact, I was expecting that, since Clark was being rather rebellious and argumentative at that point in time. He loves his dad, but for some reason, he decided to let his dad die. As such, this is not Jonathan Kent. And because this is not Jonathan Kent, this is no longer Clark Kent. This is someone else. And this dog is one of the quickest, weakest, and ham-fisted MacGuffins I've ever seen. Without a proper Jonathan and Martha Kent, you will not have a Clark Kent. And thus, you will not have a classical Superman. You have a DC movie Superman, whatever that is now. If you get the characterization or foundational backstory of a character wrong, you're telling an entirely different story. Everything is going to feel different. If that's the intention, you have to give us something else of value to admire or believe in, some virtue we have to look in awe about. Clark, just being a super strong guy from another planet who had a wise alien dad, doesn't really amount to much. The other form of tone is through setting and visuals, how the movie feels by how it looks and sounds. The color palette of the set design, the lighting, the costumes, and of course, the music determines the setting and its tone. Tim Burton's Batman and his depiction of Gotham is the best example of this. People have criticized Man of Steel and the future DC movies because the overall feeling is too dark. Now, that is incorrect. Tone of setting is irrelevant if tone of character or characterization is off. Now, that's quite the contrary. Showing a bright, honest, truthful, courageous Superman would be an excellent contrast with a dark, somber setting. It would show Superman is the shining beacon, the light in the darkness, and one ideal hope humanity has. Instead, Superman's idealism, the, the thing that makes him a hero, never really shines through because his father taught him uncertainty, fear, and to be secretive instead of the classical Jonathan Kent teaching confidence, courage, honesty, and subsequently the American way. This is something the show Smallville was showing us at nearly every turn in its 10-year run. Seeing how destructive Eric got? It just reminds me of how special you really are. That's because Eric didn't get my two strongest gifts. You and Mom. Maybe you did misread it, Clark. But even if you didn't, it's you who decides what kind of a life you're going to lead. Not me, not your mother, not your biological parents. What if it's part of who I am? Is that the kind of person I will become? Clark Kent, you're here to be a force for good, not a force for evil. Well, how can you be so sure? Because I am your father. I raised you. And I know you better than anyone. Son, you're going to have to make choices in your life, moral choices that she and I will never have to make. But we both know that when that time comes, you'll do what you think is best. What's right. That's what's important. So for a superhero movie to be believable, superheroes need some kind of secret identity. Apparently. We get it. But there's much, much more to Clark Kent, or at least there should have been. Man of Steel never really addressed Clark as having a significant alter ego, aside from his change to become a reporter at the end of the movie, which makes the whole conflict rather foolish, as if the Kent family never considered Clark wearing a mask or, or dressing up as someone else so he could save people while he's in disguise. If they were going to be practical, 
and fearful of their son being revealed to the world for his secrets, why wouldn't they address his desire to want to help others and how to go about doing that effectively by hiding his face and his body? This is a very simple thing to do. You just change your clothing and you put on a mask. In the TV show Smallville, a young Clark moves so fast he doesn't need a face mask. He even wears a Superman logo t-shirt and wears a black trench coat at times and he's called The Blur. He's originally called the Red Blue Blur and before that's he started wearing black in the first place. So if Man of Steel's Clark really wanted to help people and he was as good as natured as, as clever as he should have been, this would have been addressed in the movie. Instead, the Kent family comes across as terrified farmers sequestering their family even to the point of a, a ridiculous suicide or a family dog because the existence of aliens would be much too dangerous to the entire world, which makes this scene egregious. Clark moves faster than the speed of sound. He can pick up and toss large vehicles. Everyone's getting hit by a gigantic tornado. Visibility is really, really low. Noise is way too loud. I think Mr. Supersonic over here can solve the problem of saving an old man and a dog in a few milliseconds, and no one would be able to see what just happened. The heart and soul of Superman is Jonathan Kent, the American rural family on a farm, the salt of the earth family helping an immigrant and raising them as their own. This is why Man of Steel failed. If you take that American family that raised an alien into a human man, then you're not telling a Superman story for whatever live-action movie you're trying to make. You're just telling some lame, flaccid fanfic Elseworlds comic, putting that into a movie that no one would even care to watch. Another different example of how the medium and primary source could have little conflict is the animated movie market. DC has done an excellent job at maintaining the characterization and plot of original comic stories to animated direct-to-DVD or streaming movies. I won't go through all of them, but they're all based on existing storylines in the DC Universe, usually around Batman and Superman. It's pretty good. They're all decent. This is a no-brainer. In all of these, we can see the premise of a production, meaning the whole point of making the thing in the first place is closer to that of the artistic endeavor of the artist instead of trying to be a blatant cash-in at the box office, because there is no box office. Story and characterization is king, and I can say with confidence that bringing such stories to life is in the heart of every animator on the job. What man or woman who didn't love making animation wouldn't jump at the chance to animate their favorite comic characters? This is purely a labor of love, and I would imagine the vision of the premise is shared between each and every animator on the team. They're animators. They painstakingly draw frames of animation. This is further done by lead animators or keyframers who do storyboarding and set the main frames of the production, allowing the normal animators to fill in the frames between the keys. There's, there's not much lost from comic to animated movie. Marvel films are highly calculated pieces of cinema. They're designed to appeal to the masses, but in order to do that, they have to be reasonably family-friendly, they have to have lots of action, and be highly sensational. This also involves the combining of multiple genres of fiction. Nearly all of these stories are the genre of action-adventure, and then there's the subgenre of superhero, and then there's the whole comedy-romance dramas. The Avenger franchise are sometimes ensemble casts, which sometimes partake in the heist scenarios. In order to do one genre properly is hard enough, so combining genres is progressively more complicated. Every scene needs to count every shot, every line, every sound effect, every character, and every plot. Combining storylines to be effective is even more daunting can't do very much romance and comedy in a bleak, dark setting. Just look at Thor the Dark World, perhaps one of Marvel's largest misses. It's been a very strange day. Oh, I am. Jane, what? Where were you? Where were you? Man of Steel and Batman v Superman failed to capitalize on Superman as being a shining beacon in a dark world of fear and crime. And if it can't get one genre and theme right, it can't go much further in another theme, or even another character for that matter in any complexity. Everything has to be solid and interconnected. Marvel took one of the biggest genres, space opera, with the Guardians of the Galaxy franchise, and turned it into a summer blockbuster, combining comedy and action into a special effects spectacle, all to come together into one overarching plotline, the Infinity Gauntlet story. This is rather unique as stories tend to diverge as opposed to converge. But the comic book world, with its hundreds of writers constantly reinventing their classic characters, is certainly capable of combining genres 
characters and storylines into one. If we read some of these comic books, we see a lot of the Marvel comics being group stories or their teams of superheroes. Most recently, the Infinity War movie are lightly inspired by the Infinity Gauntlet series. Whereas the popular DC comics are clearly Superman and Batman, Marvel has had great success with Spider-Man, the X-Men, and next in line being Captain America and the Avengers. I've read a few superhero comics in my time, and I can say the JLA, or DC's Justice League America, is one of the most schizophrenic, disjointed series of comics I've ever seen. Every page is either dedicated to one superhero, like Aquaman does his Aquaman thing, and then it jumps to another one on the next page, and there's so many characters doing their thing within the span of 22 to 28 pages, not much can happen without tight writing. Whereas the Marvel comics routinely have a series of groups of families or friends acting out dramas that deal with the interpersonal relationships between them, their personal and romantic ones usually, as well as the action and life-threatening conflicts that they get into. It is one flavor of melodrama that actually works. Not so much in the DC world. Marvel stories tend to be more intricate and down-to-earth, while DC stories are more grandiose and earth-shattering. Obviously, both studios do big and small stories in all shapes and sizes, but Marvel superheroes appear to be more human and relatable, while DC superheroes tend to be more overpowered and alien or godlike. Simply put, Marvel has more relatable, more successful ensemble cast stories than DC, and it shows. Errors in production. When a production is faulty, one can look to the quality of the recording first, but before that, you can look straight to the script. If the storytelling isn't worthwhile, empty, or, or simply bad, people kind of see it. They know it. The image becomes unclear. The premise is kind of flaky. The actors, the crew, something, something is off. People talk, and ultimately, films get reshot. Dear Blade. A quick Google search shows us that the latest Marvel reshoots are from the upcoming Avengers 4 and Captain Marvel films. DC has reshoots for upcoming Shazam and Aquaman, but we already know about the extensive reshoots of Justice League and Suicide Squad. Now, not all reshoots are created equal, and the one good DC movie, being Wonder Woman, had only one minor reshoot. Jenkins, the director of Wonder Woman, said this. That scene was just a slightly tense scene of them walking. I was like, I need her to see some brutality. So we added her seeing the horses being whipped. It was actually something that had been in the script originally. Wonder Woman was universally considered DC's good movie because it had a good script. And the one reshoot simply added a scene which was supposed to be in there anyway. All for one clear reason to increase the tension in a scene. It's, it's like asking for more black pepper on your meal because even though there was already some pepper on it, it just needed that little extra punch. Compare that reshoot to Suicide Squad, which spent tens of millions of dollars to include more action. Apparently, the Warner Brothers executives were testing two versions of the movie, one of which was edited by the company called Trailer Park that put together the original trailer of the film. When executives are playing with versions of a finished movie for test audiences, and they got the trailer guys to edit one version, you know something is rotten, in the state of Denmark. This makes making a movie for the purposes of making a product people actually want, aka a good story, with nice production values, become less sincere, as it becomes more of a method to sell tickets. Getting the guys who made the trailer to edit the film goes to show that there's something wrong with the entire production, and the executives are doing the best thing they can think of, which is to use what's already working, the popularity of the first trailer. So this trailer company used licensed music, but not just any music, the most popular rock song of all time, Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody, as well as The Sweets Ballroom Blitz, and a few others, which were neatly timed with action and dialogue scenes. Using licensed music isn't uncommon, but maybe not so many pieces, and throughout three trailers. The first trailer, which I thought was amazing, it was like absolutely fantastic, it was enough to get me in the theater, that's why it was so good. It seems the executives were trying to pull off the success of Guardians of the Galaxy by buying licensed music, even though licensing music had nothing to do with the narrative of their story, which it did in Guardians of the Galaxy. It seems more likely that they were trying to compete with the Marvel formula without actually understanding what makes Marvel movies work or what the formula was, and instead hoping they just add the same elements in a recipe and boom, make a new cash cow franchise. Suicide Squad was bloated, nonsensical, 
and ultimately unnecessary. Story Adaptation Whereas the first point deals with an adaptation from comic to live-action movie and changing a story to fit within the confines and rules of a different medium, story adaptation has to do with changing a story to adapt to a different story. Now you might be thinking, why change a story at all? Comic books are essentially a series of storyboards all done for you, and it's quite easy to make that movie or into an animated film. You find actors that look the part, and you should easily make a lot of money. So why would you need to change things? Well, Joe and Anthony Russo of Marvel fame explain it as such. If I want a literal interpretation, I'll just read the book. As far as fan service goes, every fan wants something different. You can't please all fans. We're fans, and we love making these movies, and we loved comic books growing up. So our mandate all along has been that we're going to make something that pleases us, that we're happy with, and that we're excited about, and that we want to share with people. Then we keep our fingers crossed that everybody's as excited about it as we are. So Marvel comic book stories are purposely different not only for the medium, but on philosophical reasons, for showing fans something different yet paying homage to the primary source. Whereas DC movies are insulting to fans because they do not respect the primary source, and instead try to create some bizarre other DC universe that doesn't quite appeal to anyone, not to fans of the characters, and they fail at even using basic storytelling techniques. Luckily, that was not the fate of Wonder Woman. But why did Wonder Woman and the Marvel movies work? Quite simply, they used the proper method of storytelling, aka the hero's journey. Now, this is no surprise. All good stories follow the hero's journey to some capacity. It's more prevalent in Marvel, maybe. And by virtue, that makes them good stories, and their execution makes them good movies. We need to see characters' plots, their weaknesses, them overcoming or succumbing to their weaknesses, and then the result therein. Notice how the hero doesn't have to win, as we can see in Infinity War. Even though I haven't even seen that movie, I can pretty much guess what happens because I read the original comic series and the memes are already part of our culture. Aside from the hero's journey, this article by Justin Konaki explains some basic tenets the formula Marvel has been following. An emotionally distant anti-hero, the hero's mentor will usually die, a sassy independent badass woman, the hero will learn that he or she always had the power to solve problem X all along, and the final boss battle will be anticlimactic as hell. The example he shows is of Thor Ragnarok, an actual Marvel film I did watch, which also is because of the trailer. I guess I'm just really susceptible to good trailers, or maybe it's just the 80s, I don't know. Anyway, it's a formula of sorts that Marvel is adapting from the original story of comics and making something new with it, the key ingredient being the hero's journey or the progression of a character. Now, I'm simplifying things here, of course, but the two main components of the hero's journey are character development and a clearly discernible antagonist. And similar to the first point in this vid, also considering things for time and simplicity, every scene of a good story should have at least these two elements. Plot, characterization, or character weakness being attacked and developed. So, in every scene of Thor Ragnarok, we know why Thor is doing what he's doing in a sort of goofy way that he is. There's Loki, there's Hulk Banner, there's Valkyrie. They're all expressing themselves, showcasing their weaknesses and character traits. We see their humility, their humanity, their plights, and their reasons to act. It's all very clear. Even a side character gets a chance to redeem themselves. It's beautiful. The contrast between a fun, action-packed movie like Ragnarok and let's say, Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice, is quite clear. The bat is dead. Bury it. Why would these two guys fight each other? In the comic Batman and the Dark Knight Returns issue 4, it's because the US government asked Superman to take Batman down, who is deemed a fugitive by the Gotham City Police. Additionally, he's implicated in the murder of the Joker, even though the Joker committed suicide to make it look like Batman did the deed. This is why Batman and Robin turned the mutants and sons of the Batman into a non-lethal vigilante gang, turning Gotham into the safest city in the United States. The conflict becomes what Clark and Bruce have become, what their parents taught them, and what lessons they learned from each other. This is all within the backdrop of a World War III scenario of Ronald Reagan and Russia launching missiles. Instead of any of those interesting elements, the movie showcases Superman fighting Batman because... Lex Luthor told him to, and Lex is holding Martha Kent hostage. If you kill me, Martha dies. And if you fly away, Martha also dies. But if you kill the bat, Martha lives. 
and Superman didn't bother to try and like that. Like that's it. There's no contrast between the different styles of justice each vigilante holds, the arguments on methods or senses of morality. It's just because someone told Superman to do so, and Bruce got angry at the death and destruction of Metropolis, which was actually a solid reason for Batman to dislike Superman, but then devolved into stupid math. He just Alfred count the dead. Thousands of people. What's next? Millions. He has the power to wipe out the entire human race. And if we believe there's even a 1% chance that he is our enemy, we have to take it as an absolute certainty. And all Clark had to do was say, hey, uh, Lex is holding my mom hostage, so that's why I'm fighting you. Please help me. I don't want to kill you. My mom's name is Martha, by the way. Bruce, please. I was wrong. You have to listen to me. Lex wants to... <laughs> You don't understand. There's no time. I understand. Or words to that effect. And instead we get the nonsensical Martha statement and somehow combine that with the death of Superman storyline. Uh, Doomsday is, is now Z from Zod's corpse. Some nods to potential feature movies, and it's just a mishmash. It's a pile. It's a stupid plot and broken characterization. This is not Batman. I'm not sure what this guy's doing. I don't know what's going on. Whereas Superman is straightforward and believes in respecting others regardless of being a vigilante, Batman is a violent criminal who believes in more underhanded and ingenious methods of achieving victory. Dawn of Justice should have been about two conflicting methods of justice or ideologies and methodologies of two vigilantes that, that, that they do and how they do it and their struggles to overcome the other, understand each other and, and why they're fighting. What is justice really? How do we get there? Are we against it? Are we criminals ourselves? Zack Snyder could have played with the concept of Batman's brother eye, which Christopher Nolan sort of did in The Dark Knight, only with cell phones, constantly spying on everyone, kind of what the NSA is doing with the American people right now. This would have been a very easy adaptation, as was already done in the Nolan Batman trilogy, since they seem to be wanting to copy the success of that for some reason. But let's not get into that rigmarole. There's obviously lots of other factors when taking a primary source into a new medium, but if the plot and characterization is not maintained, if the focus on the new medium is not respected, and massive errors in judgment and vision are allowed, you're going to have a recipe for disaster. Special thanks to Ian Kennedy for his topic suggestion. Thank you for listening, and here's hoping some franchises, if they ever do get the light of day, know what they're doing and where they're coming from.